talk to parents like now I always try to remind them like it's it's not your dream it's your child's dream so you got to remember that and your, your kids are gonna make it kind of with or without you welcome, welcome to, to the new series cocktails and conversation with Kat and Nat and we've decided to bring you all of these conversations with people that we like to have where there's a little bit of wisdom always hilarity and hilaria yes. some famous some just cool, some drink, some don't drink, but there's always a conversation. Cheers, join us. Yeah. <gasps> Haley, I'm like, I just, I feel like you're the highest achieving human I've ever spoken to. <laughs> I'm like, usually we, uh, we, usually we ask our guests to like um, tell, tell us about themselves but I really think with all of these things I think that maybe I should do uh, your intro because I, then I could read it you don't do. have to remember That's all the things that you've done in your life okay <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile I'm in bed so why don't you go ahead and, and read what she's done while I lie in my bed okay that sounds great you're about to feel really bad about yourself Kat okay? no I already know my husband my husband was a hockey player by the way Haley so he's very well aware of of you I see. And, pardon what I, said, I see i see yeah, oh i see, I see. so here we go <sighs> yeah he's 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 not lazy like us either but anyways guys we're so <laughs> excited to have Haley wickenheiser on our uh podcast for so many reasons um in case you were living under a rock or you need a reminder of who she is i'm going to say her bio She's done so many things that here we go. Okay. She's the longest serving member of Canada's national women's team. She competed in the first five Olympic games in which women's hockey was included, winning four gold and one silver medal, making her the most Canada's most decorated Olympics. I love that decorated. It's, I just feel like there's just jewelry everywhere, like medals all over the place. Um, Haley's Olympic experience is not limited to hockey. She competed in softball at, in, at Sydney 20 not 20, 2000, um, making her Not the second can what? Keep going. Just because I don't know how to read, Kat, okay? Got it. <sighs> Uh, making her the second Canadian female athlete to compete at both the summer and winter games. Haley was Canada's flag bearer for the Sochi 2014 games in 2017. She retired from competitive hockey. Wait for it. And she's late. And she later was an assistant director of player development for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And she is now in med school to becoming a freaking doctor. <laughs> okay so i'm tired just from saying that let alone you doing it all Haley. oh my gosh you just thought being a doctor would be the right next step i well you know the truth is i knew i'd have to have a life after hockey i wasn't one of those uh those male nhl players making millions so um when you know the on the on the female side of the game you're always thinking about life after because you have no choice so um, medicine was always something that i love since I was a kid when I grew up in a little town in Saskatchewan and uh, we had these like rural doctors and um, they really inspired me to want to go into medicine so I always I always knew I wanted to go to medicine I just didn't know if I would actually do it but here I am where are you living now so I I'm in I go between Calgary and Toronto and uh, I work for the Leafs with um, with my job with uh, player development and um, but I started started medicine in Calgary and then when, when I got call from the Leafs I said I'd love to work for the Leafs but I need to finish medicine because I started this journey and uh, so I've been flying back and forth several times a month for the last few years doing it. That's kind of exciting. Now um, what kind of a doctor do you want to be? Uh, emerge. Oh emerge. my gosh and um, <laughs> I was just thinking this morning I was just like thinking just that you know Kat has three kids I have four kids all of them are going to become something in their lives I'm like would they have been showing an interest in um, medicine and being a doctor by now? Would we already know if that's what they wanted to do? Are they going to pop out of nowhere after high school and be like, oh, I'm being a doctor? They might. They might. I mean, um, you know, my mom and dad were teachers. I have, no, I have no medicine in my family whatsoever. So I don't know. I guess it just happened for me. But again, my son, he's, he's 20 now. He, he has never liked hockey. He's, he, he hates hockey. Started your crying. son is your son is twenty. Mm-hmm. Yes, he is. 
Whoa! <laughs> I was imagining your son was going to be young, and then I was thinking about how amazing it is that you get to fly and leave him every a few times a month. <laughs> No, oh, now God. he comes with me. He comes with me all the time because oh. he wants to be in Toronto. So there you go. <laughs> oh, my I have God. so many questions for you. I think like on so many levels, but like number one, w when you started hockey, how old were you? Yeah. And was it even a sport for girls like it is to like, I mean, it's barely available for girls right now. It's like more prominent, but it that's only been in the last few years really mm -hmm. where it's been accessible to everybody. So I guess I'll start with that just because we have, we have daughters and we hear that at age 11, they begin to lose confidence in everything and drop out of sports. And I yeah. don't know. So wh how did you start and what age? Yeah. So I, um, like, as I said, I grew up in a town of 1800 people. So, um, Sean in Saskatchewan. So I started playing when I was five and my parents, um, my dad, they were teachers. So, you know, in a small town, life is around the rink. That's where you go. And um, my dad played old timers hockey. He wasn't like anything special as a player, but I watched a lot. And I remember asking if I could play. So they said, sure. And they put me uh, in hockey. And then my dad built a rink in our backyard for myself, Did you and her sis brother and sister. You yeah. have a brother and a sister. I have a younger brother and sister. Yeah. And in our neighborhood growing up, we had 30 kids on our block. So it was just like a giant party block party all the time. We were all lived outside and we all ran around all the time. And so we had like these built in hockey teams that we basically grew up with. And uh, they loved having me play in our town because I was a body, right? You could, you know, you were short kids to make teams. So they were like, Oh, you want to play? Sure. No problem. And um, that's kind of how it started for me. So I was- Were there know, lots of girls or not? Were you the only girl? I was the only girl. My best friend played a little bit and then she stopped, but I was the only girl consistently playing in my town. And in fact, I thought it was the only girl like playing hockey in the world until I watched, it was the 1990 Women's Worlds and it was the pink jerseys on television. It was the first world championship for women's hockey. And I, and I was like, oh my God. They, they exist. They're out there. I was watching in the basement and that's when I knew I might have a, a future with hockey. So, you know, so the whole thing, if they can see it, they can be it. It's real. I think, for girls. So obviously like, okay, so we picture I love that. You heard that right now. You, you, if you, if you can see it, you can be it because they, they can't see it a lot and it's not on prime time and it's not, it's not like you just said, what the men are making and so it's you're so right that's such a yeah such we a were thing. we were doing a, a a podcast with candace parker and she was playing a game that night and we're like oh my god we're gonna go watch it and couldn't get it on our tv you know men, yeah. men's basketball absolutely but we could i wanted like we all wanted to sit down and watch it we couldn't see it it was really shitty but okay so for um you guys don't get tsn6 <laughs> right I, tsn55 no yeah. <laughs> so so you obviously so I, I'm assuming when you were five and you started playing hockey you immediately liked it you weren't pushed to like it no I loved it it was my like my calling I, it, I always gravitated towards it yeah okay and what were you what was your parents involvement for you to become like to help his you can't do this on your own to yeah. how much how much involvement did they have to help push you to get where you want to go yeah, so uh, it's interesting. My my dad always coached and my mom was always involved. So I always say like my parents were always around, but they were never helicopter parents. They were never pushy. Um, like many times I remember my mom saying to me like, do you want to, do you want to stop? Cause this is really hard. It's hard to watch you go through all this. Like, are you sure you don't want to do something else? Like they were very non pushy. The only thing, the only rule that we had in our house was that um, my parents were really active and fit. And so they just said, we don't care, but you have to do something. You have to play a sport, do an activity, you've got to move. And that was basically the only rule that we had. So it was easy, you know, for me playing hockey, but they were really um, non-pushy. And when I talk to parents, like now, I always try to remind them, like, it's, it's not your dream, it's your child's dream. So you got to remember that. And your, your kids are going to make it kind of with or without you. I mean, of course I had an incredible support system and that was built around me and I was fortunate that way, but um, you know, my mom and dad had kind of allowed me to sink or swim on my own, which was good. Did your um, uh, brother and sister um, be, uh, become competitive athletes at all? Yeah, they were. My brother was, um, was a very good hockey player. He could have probably, uh, he would have played in, uh, 
at least the junior WHL um, or higher, but he had a really bad experience with a coach in Bantam and he, he quit. He was drafted a high draft pick and he quit hockey, which was unfortunate. And then my sister played, but my sister is a teacher. She was more of like a social butterfly. She liked the dressing room and she liked hanging out. She wasn't really too competitive. <laughs> so uh -huh. you know, she found her calling in teaching and uh, yeah, so, but we all played. That 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 makes you laugh because Cat's son um plays hockey. He loves playing hockey, but he really also loves the dressing room. Like he loves just being with the guy, having so much he fun does, with He them. likes to celebrate the game. You know what I mean? He loves <laughs> to celebrate and he's like high fiving everyone. And my husband He's like, good and oh. he loves it too, so That's he awesome. begs. Please, because I don't really think I can put him in lessons because he loves the team so much. So to go and do lessons is so like uh, but when it's a team, yes, you know. Oh, yeah, he's a social guy. <laughs> oh um, yes. I guess my I, I a question for I don't know your opinion on this or how you feel about girls in sports or like as women and as moms, um, you know, who don't play necessarily sports but are are try to be active. Like, is it just something your kids have to love or can you force them to partake right. in teams and especially Haley because I know like when you said your parents said that you had to be active and uh we totally we, we totally agree with that and that so far all of our kids have chosen something at least one thing to do and I'll never forget there's like this dad that I know and he's who's older and his kids ski and I was like wasn't skiing so expensive and he's like ski uh rehab's more expensive I, <laughs> I just let them roam free they're gonna go get addicted to drugs but um yeah, if you have yeah. a kid, if you have a kid that doesn't have a specific interest or like, you know, natural talent in a sport, like yeah. can you how do you encourage this? Well, I think you got it. So now it's all about like early specialization. You know, kids play hockey around, or kids specialize in tennis at like age eight with a personal coach, which is like insanity. Mm -hmm. So you got to expose your kids to. I just think if you can, if you if you're fortunate, you can give them a lot of different opportunities in a lot of different sports, um, or or activities. I say sports, but I mean it could be like orienteering or like whatever, like just something that they enjoy to do. I think kids will find they'll ultimately find their passion. I mean, I can think of my own son. I was dragging him around to world championships, and we were at a world championship in Ottawa and uh, it was his birthday. And so I got invited by some of the special forces guys for him to come and shoot C8s at a gun, at a gun range in Ottawa. And he fell in love with it and joined the cadets. And then he recently joined the reserves in the military. And so that's his passion. He, he was in the cadets for years. And I, you know, I grew up kind of as a kid thinking, oh, cadets were only for nerds and those types of things, you know, in my town. And then I got to be around the cadets and see like what an amazing program it is for kids for, for all walks of life. And it really changed his life. That kid, it gave him discipline and it gave him something that he loved to do. So you never know where you'll fall into it, but I think just be open and, and uh, you know, expose them to as much as possible. And as long as they're doing something, like you said, they're not in rehab, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Rehab is really think, expensive. Yeah. I think it's really hard though right now because like sports are number one super expensive. Like number two, it's like I I struggle with like um like did did it w when you were thirteen years old playing hockey were you with other women girls or were you still with boys or like what did you do when your body began to change and you're like I, I just. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? My my son has one girl on his team right now, okay? So she has yeah. one girl on his team. And I I hope oops, I hope that she stays there. For yes. so he can see that girls are actually she's the best fucking skater on the team. And, the and he says skater. that, which is great. Yes. Yeah, and they I are. hope they she are. stays yeah. on that team, but I bet when she's 13 in the change room with a bunch of boys Yeah. Can, well, I played, I mean, I played, uh, I played up to midget AAA, which is 15, 16 years old with the boys. And I, I think I started changing in my own change room when I was 10. I think that's when oh. they were like, you have to go maybe a little older, like 10, whatever. And so then, you know, you're separated. And the hard part, I didn't care because for me, it wasn't social. I just wanted to play the game. I was very driven. But I think for a lot of girls, that's hard when you're suddenly isolated and you're by yourself. And it's yes. not everybody, right? 
So a lot of girls will switch. They'll switch to girls hockey. But now compared to when I was that age, 20 some years ago, it's like much, there's much more um, uh, opportunity and the level is better and all that stuff. So that's not so much of a big deal. But I remember when I was uh, 14 or 15, I had switched to playing women's hockey um, because uh, I was trying out for the national team. <laughs> And uh, here I am playing with women that are like 30, 35 years old. Like my first roommate on the national team was a grade 10 math teacher and I was a grade 10 math student. Oh so, my gosh. Can you imagine the poor woman she had to deal with me? But um, yeah, that was my first experience. So she's I so really like that you said the you. poor woman. I was thinking poor. so poor you, you had to be with this grown up. <laughs> oh, oh, I hated that. Yeah, no, they were amazing. These women, like, they they really, like, shaped my life. Like, I really grew up in the national team program and, like, for 25 years, whatever I was around. And um, they were from all walks of life. They were they were teachers. They were lawyers. They were, um, like, professional businesswomen that also played hockey because you also had to have, like, another life and another career. Right. And so they were tough. Like, they taught me about, like, how to train and, you know, how to grow up really fast at that age. So it was pretty cool. Did you, did, your, oh. wait, did your parents say goodbye to you and like you went to go billet? Were they like, bye, and you went and lived with these grown-ups? Uh, kind of, although with the national team, we get pulled together. So I still, uh, I think I moved out of home when I was 17, but when I was 15, we were getting, we were having camp. So they'd pull us in for two to four weeks and then you'd go home and you'd come back and forth. But my mom and dad were leery. They, they thought I should play like another Canada games, which is kind of like, the, you know, mini Olympics for, for kids under 18. And I was determined I was going to play on the national team. So they were like, okay, good luck. <laughs> oh my <laughs> they didn't know much say or do, but uh, they, they knew pretty quick that it, it was going to be my decision, I think. So, it was so were you really good or were you really talented? Or I mean, did you, were you Worked naturally really hard. talented or did you work really hard? Um, both. I think I was gifted with, a, a, with being a good athlete. Um, just, I was at a young age, very coordinated in those things, but I, hmm. my dad will say that my sister was a better hockey player, but I worked harder. So I think, um, oh. yeah, I think that I had the work ethic thing, uh, down pat. I, I always through my whole career said, you know, there might be better talent, but I'm going to make sure that nobody outworks me so that's kind of my motto. you're my husband you're my husband Haley you're my husband you're the same <laughs> you look very different though yeah. <laughs> Haley, um when um uh, oh this is what I want to know okay so you obviously grew up in sports and you'd see all these kids and you know what your parents were like you know how they were like they didn't pressure you they, had, they made sure that you were still comfortable and then you have and then you have a grown son now do you, do you, can you see things in parents at like sporting like practices and events that you're just like, you're doing like, you're, you're doing such a disservice to your child, the way that you're, you're behaving or intervening. And if so, what did those things look like? Like if any parents out there are doing those things, what do they look like that we might want to stop? Oh yeah. Well, I run a hockey festival called Wick Fest. So every year we put 7,000 people through our festival. So I get to see literally thousands of parents coming through the door from girls ages five to 18 years old. And I pick them out right away. I can pick them out mile, mile away. You can just tell there's a look like the moms have a look, the dads have a look <laughs> and they have a vibe. And I, I, if I see it, if I see um, like behavior that is not acceptable, I will actually confront people in the rink and I will ask them to leave or step out of the rink if excess yelling or just crazy hockey parent um like we just don't stand for it so and, you know i would say majority of parents are amazing like 90 percent of parents they truly are like they're awesome and they're super supportive and sometimes they get carried away and that we all do but then there's the 10 percent or so that are just that shit crazy yes <laughs> and just, you know, like that cat, from the rink. cat had cat had some um, parents on her team where she was telling me stories and she's like it was the parents the parents were fighting yes i've um, seen it Yes. But I do love the ones that just get a little, like, worked up. That's my favorite, sitting in the hockey rink. There's, like, this one mom. She doesn't do anything bad, but she gets so into it. It's, like, my best entertainment. I'm not watching the game. I'm just watching her. It's oh, such yeah, a good time. Best. So but for as all long of as the... it's harmless, you know. If they, yeah, everybody gets excited and, you know, every, every once in a while crosses the line. But I, I actually <laughs> think the greatest thing out of this pandemic might be the yeah. fact that parents can't go into the rink. You have to wait outside. I think that that's actually an amazing thing. 
I actually heard that um, uh, uh, coaches feel that way, and so do teachers. Finally, these parents that won't get out of the school can't Don't, come in. Can't come in. I have a question for you for all the batshit crazy parents since you coach and you develop. <laughs> like, do you see a difference? Is there a massive difference in children who practice and their parents get them um, specialized coaches versus the kids who play a reasonable amount? Right. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, is there yeah. a, a massive... Are you like, whoa, that kid trained a thirty hundred hours versus that one who you know? I love the number thirty hundred cat. Again, yeah. showing hey. the, our geniusness. No, just because it's such an unrealistic number. You know what I okay. mean? Those okay, parents yeah, who yeah. are like who I I God, I'm sure this person listens to the fucking podcast, but there's someone on one of my children's teams who calls the coach and they're young children after every practice or game and wants to know what they need to hire basically a specialist in to work on to yes. get that child better in the spot that they're less than. And these children are all under the age of, let's just say eight. Yeah, so they should be fired as a parent. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so here's the thing is that in the short term, if you have, like anything, if your kid is specializing in whatever it's gonna be, yeah, they're gonna get really good at that, maybe for the short term. But I can guarantee you over the long, the long haul, which it's a long life and a long career and long maturity, that always evens out. And they're, they're, it's proven time and time again, you look at the best hockey players, let's just take Crosby, Gretzky, Shanahan, like some of these guys that they could have played at another sport. So when I'm working with the Leafs and I see players coming up, often the best hockey players, they're not the ones that just played hockey all, over, all year round. They did other sports. You put them on a basketball court, they can shoot a basketball. They can, you know, pick up a baseball bat and hit. So um, you'll see the difference when, yeah, if a kid's playing all year round, they're going to come at an eight years old and maybe come flying out of the blocks in September. But when they're 15, they've quit hockey and they're probably pretty miserable. So that's what I always say is over the long haul, like who cares? And it's, it's, it's completely unnecessary. By playing other sports, you can really, you can make up for that. I mean, my, I guess the question is though, like the, the people who are, are specializing so hardcore, really upping the ante for every time. So they're creating a, a, this crazy mentality because if, yeah. your teammate is skating seven times uh, a week and yeah. they're going to get on the better team. And then that better team is basically chosen at nine years old and That's your path is determined at nine years old, which is how is this possible? And how is, at least in Toronto, I don't yeah. know about the rest of the world, but a lot of these sports, football in America, soccer, all of them, like my daughter is basically at 10 years, 11 years old she goes into the next best stream of soccer at, at 11 years old they decide who's going to be mm -hmm. in the stream and i'm like how is this possible what do we yeah, do about I, this i know it's it's a problem i remember my son was a competitive swimmer and i would say to the swim club man like let these kids do something other than swim like take them onto the gym and play basketball and they were so anti anything but swim because in the mentality is uh, only unless you've swam, swam 30 hundred hours can you be a good swimmer so um that it is a problem and i think we have to change the culture and the mentality when i played in europe it was uh it was interesting because they're incredibly patient with the way they develop athletes and mm. uh, they there is um prestige for the best coaches coaching the youngest kids they actually get paid to do it it's not a demotion in canada it's volunteer moms and dads that are coaching so i think one of the ways we could switch it is to really put qualified people in and, and look at the way we're developing because the rest of the world is kind of catching us when it comes to sports like hockey and other sports. We're not the clear favorite anymore. And by playing all year round, that certainly isn't helping us. So, you know, I agree with you. I think it's a problem. I think Toronto is, is a real problem. I don't see it as much in other parts of the country, but the GTA is, is pretty crazy about it. Wow. Yes. So we, we, you, I, I, I'm so glad to hear you say this and I, I really hope we do change it because it breaks my heart that at nine years old, kids are, are being chosen, are basically determined for the rest of their life what stream they'll play in, right? Like it's really hard to move up from a stream after you've been put, been put in a, a category at eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, 
can can you change it? Can we change it or like it's a lost cause for GTA? Well, I think what we can change is our attitude towards it. So for example, like being more patient with, with kids, like, you know, young teenage boys are dropping out of hockey at an alarming rate in this country at 14 years old, if they're not drafted in the Bantam draft, which means absolutely nothing, whether you're gonna make the NHL or not. <laughs> Um, but that, that's this, this mentality that we have, we're just so like crazy about it. And I think we need to like back off a bit. We need to, um, let our kids develop at their own pace and not write kids off. You know, if you're 14, you haven't developed. Well, Henrik Zetterberg made the NHL at age 25. If he was Canadian, he would have never made it. He was Swedish and they were patient with him. So it's oh. um, a different mentality and we just, we have to switch, I think, the way we think because we lose a lot of kids that we shouldn't lose. A lot of talent falls, falls off the wayside. What, oh, what so are we terrible. learning? What are we learning in the sports? And like, why do we want them to stay past 14, even if they're not going to make it to the NHL? And let's be honest, like 0.5% just making it to the NHL. There's got to be there's got to be more upswing other than the NHL that these kids, which I know for a fact, but I know a lot of people don't. What mm -hmm. are these kids, what are, they, what are they earning rather than just the accolades of being the best on the ice? Yeah, well, if you, it, the stat is actually, I think one in 5,000 kids that plays midget AAA, so the highest level as a 15 year old, would make the NHL, one in 5,000, that's the stat. So the odds are pretty low. And, you know, I see it in med school. So I started med school at 39 and I'm in med school with kids that are 20 to 25 years old, right? You're doing the opposite of what you did in hockey. I know, I live life opposite. Wow. And, um, you know, you see these kids that have never played a team sport. You can always tell in the real world who, who has been around teams and, and knows how to work with people and who hasn't. And so the, like the skills that it equips kids with for life, just playing and being involved in the sport. I mean, you don't realize it. I didn't realize what I knew and how much I appreciated my team until I stepped out of hockey, how much mm -hmm. hockey has given my life and how competent the women that I played with through the years are as human beings. Like it's just, it's wow. shocking when you get into the real world, how that doesn't, that's not as common as I thought it would be. Um, cause I was so insulated in my bubble for a long time. Yeah. And yeah, learning team work is so important. That's why we say like, we want our kids to be on a team on some sort yeah. of team just to see how that works. It's a, it's a dynamic that they'll use, use forever. Like you said, what about, um, oh, gender equality in sports? Are we ever going to achieve it? And, uh, that's the one question. The other one is what can we all do to like help push it forward? Yeah. Um, you know, are we ever going to achieve it? Well, you know, at the Olympic level, for example, it's pretty close. If you look at male, female participation in the Olympics, it's like 50 to 49 to 51. It's pretty close. So yeah, we're getting there. And then, you know, at that level, they're really trying to push it, which is good. Where I think the big gap is, is as we talked earlier, like who, who's watching? Are you, are you able to turn on TSN and see the WNBA or the WNHL? Not very often. And so for me, where it starts is with eyeballs and broadcasters. And if, and it's a chicken and egg, if you don't have the, the sponsorship, you can't get the broadcast hours and vice versa. But at some point, and it's mostly men in these positions um, yes. that are making these decisions, they have to champion this. They have to want to believe in it and they have to take a chance. And so, you know, you see that in the WNBA, it's probably the most progressive sport outside of tennis. Women's tennis is pretty equal now. Um, it's come a long way, but you know, hockey's still, it's the last bastion of, you know, kind of the old white male mentality that in pro sports, the, M the NFL is ahead of it. The NBA is ahead of it. So, um, I think that's what we need is we need those male leaders to step up and champion it. We need the broadcasters to champion it. And then people have to watch it. You have to buy tickets, buy tickets to a women's sport, you know, go watch, uh, support it, get your daughters involved, those types of things. That's, that's, what's really going to change, but it's the champions and the internal people that, that really I, hold that power. I also, part of me feels like it may be like I, my daughter plays soccer four days a week and I have to go get her new soccer shoes and you know, they call it, um, they call it, uh, equal, not what, what's it when it's not boy or female? Unisex. I mean, unisex. Unisex. Oh, unisex. The yeah. wall of shoes is all unisex. 
but it's it's not it's all ma very masculine right they're just they're trying to change the language on it and she just wants pink shoes and i'm like it it drives me i feel like if we could entice girls to not feel like they have to just be masculine to be in sports yes. and if we open the sports their their minds up right because even when i was choosing a sport for my daughter to get involved in i mean if you're not hockey or soccer it's it, it's very hard to have access or dance it's really yeah. hard to have access to all kinds of different sports and it, it wasn't it hasn't been easy to get her to fall in love with a sport because there's no, there are role models, but not easily accessible. And when you walk into a sports store, it is not, it is not for the girl who also loves dresses in pink. And that breaks my heart that we can't have hockey players who love to wear dresses and soccer players who want pink shoes, you know, tennis players, they've nailed it, you know, but they've also sexualized them to a major degree. So yes. it's like this very weird dynamic that, can you make a line of soccer and hockey skates there, Haley, or what? <laughs> well, here's the thing. When I run my, my hockey festival, which includes like little five-year-olds and 18-year-olds, um, there's a lot of pink going on. And now um, you, actually can, you actually can buy like pink hockey tape and pink gloves and manufacturers like Bauer are making pink helmets. So um, they're starting to, to get on that um, you can be a, a girl, a girly girl, for lack of a better way to say it. You can be feminine and still be a great athlete. I mean, I've, play, I've played with <laughs> hundreds of those types of athletes through the years, and um, and and women and of all walks of life. And and so I think it's come. It's I'm starting to see it because Wickfest is always a barometer for me. How much pink am I going to see? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I see more and more, especially you know the five, six, seven, eight year olds that that age range so um i think i do think companies are slow like i find the hockey manufacturers they are slow to listen and slow to make changes and they can do much better same like pro hockey life sport check places like this they, they've got a responsibility to display the female athletes on the wall when you walk into the store and yes. you know i don't understand because it makes good business sense to me but i don't get it especially yeah. when it's moms mostly buying the stuff it's mostly 100%. women buying the children's gear make it women oriented and don't up the price because it's for little girls and for women make it the same as you know i spent 20 years hammering my head against the wall with these hockey manufacturers saying the same thing like how come you people cannot understand that this that these are women making these purchases so you should appeal to them but That's wow yeah it's very well, frustrating i'm glad to hear that we're moving in that direction yeah, I'm glad to hear that, you know, you're seeing progress because, you know, from where we stand, yes, we see girls definitely joining in, but it's, it's, it is hard to hear that they don't have a, an, a path that kind of end like they can't have the dream like the boys can have, you know, the boys are always like NHL, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, where yeah. the girls, it's just kind of like, they don't get to have that same conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I hope they get to. I like. Do you see that? Like Nat said about the equality and the pay. Like, will they be able to only play one sport without having to have a second job? I think so. I think that's coming. Like, uh, if the pandemic didn't happen, we may be closer to a women's professional hockey league than we ever have been before. But I think that's really set well the world back. But obviously, ho women's hockey. Be got put back on the back burner but I think we're close now I think I've had several conversations with the NHL with Gary Bettman about this very topic and I know that they're they're pretty serious about it I do think that something will happen um probably within the next couple of years so uh, a little girl can grow up I always say to little girls you're going to grow up and you're going to be able to play, play hockey for a living if you want and that's that's cool it's something I never had I you know I'm it went into med school or did other things. So um, I do think that's happening. That is, a, that is. Yeah, you, you also played with women who were doing full-time jobs and like Candace Parker is a full-time mom, full-time yeah. in the WMB. Like, you know, a lot of them had their kids with them in the bubble. And I'm just like, the women need to get paid equally because often we're also the caregivers who are trying to like yeah. work full-time and, then train full-time for a, a high-end sport 
Yeah, for sure. I think equal pay is a ways off. And, and I, I understand it to a certain extent because, you know, you, you have to be able to bring in the broadcast numbers. You have to show, you know, you have to show that, that you can make those numbers. So I think we have to start like appropriately, but appropriately paid doesn't mean low pay. It can still be great pay, yeah. you know, yeah. and but move does, up from there. Does that also mean getting girls enticed into sports so it, it reflects their interests rather than trying to make a female sport a male dominant, like convert yeah. the people so that you have, it's a cycle, right? So if we make it more friendly for girls to want to watch sports in terms of it, they reflect people who look like them, then we'll get the broadcast. Then girls will be like, I want to watch, we all watch the Raptors, you know? Exactly, we exactly. I like we, we we have to make it friendlier across the board yeah the way uh, I framed it to Gary Bettman is that why not prepare a family of four to pay eighty dollars to watch a professional women's hockey game so they're going to pay eight hundred dollars or more to watch a Leaf game someday so you're having a built-in audience as you go as you develop your product and so that's kind of the way you know I, we've been trying to pitch this thing through the years is that it's it's not just a straight loss out of your pocketbook you're building community and audience yep. and wouldn't it be wicked to do an experiment where you put all women on the ice but people don't know it's women and you like hide and everyone thinks they're men and then they watch the game and the end of the game they take their helmets off you know they think they're all the leaf players or like yeah. you know this new team and then they take their helmets off like losers you just watched women play hockey and it was amazing wasn't it <laughs> don't you want to do this? we'll do it on tv It'll be like the next reality show. We punked you good. Yes, yeah. Be, <laughs> I like fun. that game. We should do that, Nat. We should set that up. Set, okay, you guys should set that up. <laughs> really? We'll have two um, teams, all of women, and let's see if they oh, can complete it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now, we're, I think that's a good idea, Nat. We'll do that. Okay. Okay, we'll make it happen. Um, we want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy life. When are you done... Um, when do you get to be a doctor? When are you done school? Yeah, so in May I'll be. <gasps> Hopefully, you you get to you get to start a brand new life. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still work. With, I'm still working with the Leafs, so hopefully, I'll still be always dabbling. Um, I'll, hockey's always my first love, so hockey and medicine combined would be ideal. I don't know where that'll take me, but uh, getting Probably through to the dressing room. Nice. What's that? Be, like. Probably they'll be like, we have an injury, Haley. Can you want come on down and just, you'll be doing like double duty. You know what you'll I mean? You'll be, you'll be a team doctor well, and then you'll be team development. Yeah, you know what's funny is I, I never cut my face in my whole career because of, you know, I wore a mask. Even when I played pro men's hockey, I did pretty good. Just my nose once. I started working with the Leafs and what I'm out on the ice for a practice and I get a puck right in the face right here and uh, at a practice and split my lip so bad. I knew I needed like 10 stitches. So I, but we were at a different rink. So I had to drive to Scotia Bank with this giant ice pack on my face. And I would have stitched myself up if it was any other body part, but not my face. Uh, right. Really, did an amazing job on my lip. You can't even tell. So there you go. <laughs> are you, uh, what are the chances? Are you gonna practice um, um, being a doctor in Toronto or in Calgary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, we have to apply. It's a big process to get it in your residency. So I will choose, choose both, but I've worked for the Leafs, so I would love to be able to do my residency in Toronto and uh, oh continue God. that work on. So knock on wood, um, you don't really have any guarantees, but you hope you can get what you apply for. You it's are they so call It's funny how they call practice medicine. Like you practice that's kind of a bad thing. You're going to go, my, my practice, don't practice, nail it on me, okay? You better no do more, it. No more practice. Well, you are in a little mood over there, aren't you, Kat? <laughs> I just, it just, where are you going to practice? I'm like, God, they really do just practice. You hope it works out. It's, like, there's no, there's no final shot. It's one practice. That's it. There's no oh, practice yeah. time. You know what I mean? Someone you don't want to be seeing a doctor that's that. practicing. Practicing, yeah. no. They, they were funny when they made that up. Someone was in a mood when they made that word up. Well, <laughs> Haley, and Haley, thank, thank goodness that, uh, women like you exist so that uh, the, all the girls can look up and see what, what is possible. And that not only are you an amazing athlete, you worked hard to do it. And now you're brilliant becoming a doctor. Like this is, you know, Kat, we should get her to be our kid's mom. 
<laughs> Let's go drop true. seven kids off. I think, oh my you know God, what? I don't know how you guys do it. We wouldn't have to drive to hockey practice ever. They would just never, have we never have to go to the doctor. Ex oh my God. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're for one. mom. If she could just become a dentist, we'd nail it. We'd have. Thank well, you so oh much. It was so, it was so nice talking to you. It was so nice meeting you and can't wait to uh, talk more about you to our girls and, and try to help the, the mission to, um, to get one day, get more equality. And you know what? I can't wait to go tell my son about you. And then he's going to ask if you're better than his dad. Cause he always compares everyone to his dad and his dad will go. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. <laughs> and then he, yeah, he's going to say that. Why? And, then, and then we're going to do YouTube videos looking her up because <laughs> yeah, we're going to do the <laughs> like whole the thing. Oh God, there'll fight. be some videos on there. Yeah. Well, enjoy I that. Well, thanks for having me guys. We have a great show. Thanks so much. Bye guys. Okay. Have a great day. See ya. Bye. Bye, -bye.